BBOR Black Box Online Radio coming to you from West Virginia. Black Box Nerd 88 on Instagram for the bonus podcast. And just a quick reminder every Monday is Zodiac Mondays. Wednesday is an Ask Me Anything. That's an AMA, so please drop your questions below for things that you would like discussed here on the show. And Friday is an Anything Goes. Any subject is fair game, mostly talking about true crime, serial killers, the Zodiac Killer, but any subject is welcome. All right, so please share some ideas in the comment section about what you would like to hear about on this channel, and let's get started. Okay, hello everybody. I often begin these episodes by saying today is Monday, today is Wednesday, or today is Friday, but I've been on another channel for the last several days called Astro Psych 400. It is available here on YouTube. You can listen to it for free, just like the same way that you listen to and watch BBOR, and um, Astro Psych 400 has a video. I'm warning you in advance, I do appear on camera. But that's where I've been. However, I just wanted to touch base one more time because a lot of things have been in the world of true crime news. So this is going to be quite similar to last week's episode. It's going to be like the AMA where I respond to your questions and comments, the Ask Me Anything, and we can go through them together. It's also going to be like the true crime talk radio, just looking at some published news sources and responding to them. And it's also going to be dropping some announcements. But the first one that I would like to do is relevant to this channel, Black Box Online Radio. And I asked this last week, but I said, I'm going to be starting a deep dive podcast segment after I conclude the Astro Psych 400 series, which is going to be um, probably in about 10 days. I mean, going through all of the 12 zodiac signs. Yes, reading up on the zodiac killer got me very curious about astrology. And I just simply wanted to respond to some of the mainstream literature, mainstream articles on it. I'm very skeptical of that stuff, and I think if you're skeptical of astrology, you might like Astro Psych 400 even more. But the four choices that I've proposed for a podcast segment would be um, on the murder of Sherry Jo Bates, the murder of Ray Davis, the Swindle murders, that's um, Johnny Ray and Joy Swindle, or the disappearance of Donna Lass. So you can simply just put your answer in the comments section, um, just by name. You can just write Sherry Jo Bates or Donna Lass or Ray Davis or The Swindles. Which one would you like to hear about as a deep dive podcast segment? And what what the thing I'm talking about is once a week over a period of weeks or months, I will be doing a show dedicated to that mystery. And there's a difference between doing a podcast segment over a period of four months and doing one over the period of four years, because I've been listening to the Tate LaBianca radio program, which is hosted by Brian Davis and Tana Laufenberg, and they've been following the Tate LaBianca murders and Charles Manson for 15 years, and they can do things like reading 5,000 pages of transcripts, and not only that, but having all the notations like marking this page number 4,996 and so on, and then they can refer back to all of those things. What I'm imagining for this Deep Dive podcast segment is watching documentaries, listening to other podcasts, reading news articles, and definitely trying to get in touch with uh, documents from the case files of any of those cases there. One more time, the uh, choices would be Sherry Jo Bates, Ray Davis, the Swindle murders, and the disappearance of Donna Lass. So you can just write down um, whichever one you would like to hear about in the comments section, and I'm just going to be counting up the votes. I did this uh, once last year in the same way for the um, deep dive, not really a deep dive segment, that was in 2018. This was just the book discussion that was on either the myth of the Zodiac Killer or the uh, Zodiac Manson connection open discussion, which, um, but I ended up doing the myth of the Zodiac Killer. What a good transition to talk about the next piece of news. 
there's going to be a very special episode of the Stones Unturned podcast, which is hosted by that guy who wrote the book, The Myth of the Zodiac Killer. His name is Thomas Henry Horan, and he is no stranger to this channel. He contacted me privately to share something that was a very big piece of news in relation to the Son of Sam case, David Berkowitz and the shootings that took place in the 1970s in New York. Before I say more about the Son of Sam case, I also highly recommend Manny Grossman's channel. He does a lot of walkthroughs of the Son of Sam locations where the murders took place, and you can see some of these quote-unquote lovers' lanes in New York about how, um, about, like, how, um, oddly placed they are. Like, one of them was just feet away from a row of houses. So I think that it provides a very strong window into the true crime world, and you can see very clearly that um, people will you turn anything into a lover's lane if given the uh, opportunity to do so. But yes, uh, Thomas Horan contacted me about a discovery that may have been made in the Son of Sam case, and um, I was uh, really quite caught off guard with this because he said uh, something that, it turns out I was right. Craig Glassman faked his death. I mean, that is um, the uh, even the subject of this email here. Craig Glassman faked his own death. And I was just thinking about, like, Craig Glassman. Oh, I know I know that name, but where do I know that name from? And, of course, after just glancing at the email for a second, he's talking about the Son of Sam case. But um, he will do the. He will discuss this in detail on his show. And I was just looking um, at YouTube, and there was an announcement that was put out by the Professor Dad channel. He now has two channels, Thomas Horn, that is. He's going to be putting out the uh, Stones Unturned episode on his Professor Dad channel, which came out first. So that'll be coming out this weekend. But he says, one big reason I've been stalling so much this year is it took forever for New York City to get back to me. Well, it turns out I was right. Craig Glassman faked his death. No such death certificate on file. Craig Glassman faked his death in a car crash Halloween night in 1991, and his grown daughter not only visits David Berkowitz in prison, but brags about it. She posted twice on my pro boards, and twice I've asked her for a death certificate. No response, and now I know why. I don't have to tell you what this means. If Glassman undoubtedly faked his own death with cooperation from the local and national media, then who else did? I see no reason to believe that the corpse buried in John Carr's grave is John Carr, and now, this? Who else? Who else supposedly died in a car crash? Michael Carr? Who else? When I receive the, the paper copy of the official response, I will scan it and post it. And to provide a little bit of uh, context about Craig Glassman and his role of, in the Son of Sam case, I'm there is a New York Times article that was published in 1977 that has been uploaded, and I'm not the biggest fan of the New York Times, but it's titled, Neighbor Who Got Threat Letters Was at Arrest Site. And um, if you just learn a little bit about Craig Glassman, he is going to be someone who is viewed as the man who was terrorized by the son of Sam Shooter, the man who was terrorized by David Berkowitz. White Plains, New York, August 11th, 1977. Craig Glassman was still reeling at the irony of it all, and a little stunned at how he, the Westchester County Sheriff's Office, and the Yonkers Police Department had apparently stumbled into the year-long search for the 44 caliber killer. When it ended last night, Mr. Glassman, a 29-year-old Westchester County Auxiliary Deputy Sheriff, was there and aided the New York City police in the arrest of David Berkowitz, the man they suspect is the son of Sam. It's the most bizarre story you've ever heard, said Mr. Glastman. And um, this is uh, not the same guy, but this is Mr. Glastman, who also uh, made that comment there. A man who lived in the same apartment building as David Berkowitz had suspected that Berkowitz was responsible for four rambling, frequently obscene, and always threatening letters that he received since June. The last letters came on August 6th, just after someone po someone had set fire in front of Mr. Glassman's door. It was after that that he and Yonkers police began watching the comings and goings of his quiet, uncommunicative neighbor whom he had never met. In the letters, Mr. Glassman, the writer's world is one people with Demers, Satan, and apocalyptic references to 
the streets running red with blood at judgment. Mr. Glassman emerges as the master and the writer as the slave, but the paragraph written is nearly illegible. Okay, well, um, I'm, I'm just going to jump in and provide a little bit of context here. If you read that uh, particular letter, it does talk about how um, it's almost as if the son of Sam is saying, I am doing these things, but it's because Craig Glassman is the master. And uh, Mr. Glassman emerges as the master, but um, the writer is the slave. The paragraph is written in nearly illegible scrawl on blue line notebook paper. Mr. Glassman was at one point Craig Darling, at another point a force that... The letter writer wrote, Drove me into the night to do your bidding. True, I am the killer, but Craig, the killings are your command. That's very famous from the Son of Sam case. He wrote in one letter received in the mail on August 6th, I shall see you standing naked at the judgment seat. Upon your condemnation, the world shall rise in jubilation. The terrible wicked Craig is dead. They shall shout. And as you can see, um, Thomas Warren's going to be talking about something related to this guy, Craig Glassman, the person who's receiving these letters from the Son of Sam, the person whom the Son of Sam, David Berkowitz, is calling his master. I am the slave, and you, Craig Glassman, are the master, may have gone on to fake his own death. Mr. Glassman, an unsalaried corporal at the auxiliary emergency services unit of the sheriff's office, is also a registered nurse and worked for... Monte Fiore Hospital in the Bronx. Maybe he saw Craig as a symbol of authority, someone said, noting that Mr. Glassman often wore the forest green uniform of the sheriff's apartment. Maybe he thought Craig was sent there to spy on him. And this article goes on for a while, but just uh, one more time, I would like to cite the source. This is called Neighbor Who Got Threat Letters Was at Arrest Site, and it was, by, it was written by Ronald Smothers, August 12, 1977, talking all about David Berkowitz and the Son of Sam case. So, um, to provide a little bit more context about um, why Thomas Warren was looking into this, Prior to being involved in the world of the Zodiac Killer, he was a fraud investigator, and in his own terms, he became a specialist fraud investigator for people who have faked their own death. And there are actually a couple different uh, layers to this, because there's another um, element of fraud that was explored, and that is, I think, and if I can paraphrase some things I've heard Thomas Horan say before, if somebody murders their business partner to try and take over the business, or if someone murders somebody to collect the life insurance policy, maybe that's a better example, what I call the forensic files murder, because every other um, every other episode of forensic files is a, is a story like that. Someone is killed for insurance money. That person has not only committed murder, but they've also committed fraud. It's just not widely talked about in the media. So then um, this is why Thomas Warren looks at it from this angle. He says that he was a professional on this in the past. And I responded to him by saying, this could be a big discovery. Um, and I, I asked him, do you want this on or off the record? Meaning, do you want to, me to say anything? I mean, like, if you want to just, you know, keep this uh, discovery to yourself and upload it on your channel, uh, that that's fine by me. And then I can respond later. But he said, I will do a live episode detailing the entire hoax this Saturday, but I don't mind publicizing the facts as far and wide as possible. I want everybody and their dog asking Shayna Glassman as many nosy questions as possible. She has contacted me a couple of times. Both times I've asked her for a copy of Craig Glassman's death certificate. No response. Now we know why. How all this fits together in the big picture will take a long time on the podcast but there's no point in keeping this particular discovery under wraps until then. And then if all goes well, we can try and schedule something in the future. Okay, so um, please look out for Professor Dad this uh, weekend, and then the episode will also be on the Stones Unturned podcast. If you're listening to this at a, at a future date, you can check that out on Thomas Horan's channel, and also visit some of the older Son of Sam episodes here on Black Box Online Radio. And before we move on, I would just like to remind everybody that this show is available for free download at Launchpad 1, formerly known as Launchpad DM. There's a link to that in the description box here for the YouTube listeners, and you can download Black Box Online Radio, take it on the go, anywhere and anyhow. A great way to support this channel is just by listening to some more content, and um, 
using Launchpad One is a great way to do that. But you can also visit the Teespring page, to look at some of the merchandise that is available. Almost all sizes and colors are listed. And remember, being weird is not a crime. Now, the next thing I would like to talk about is just an announcement that a series of videos is coming out on Drew Beeson's channel, and this is all about D.B. Cooper. Many of you will know that Drew Beeson has a D.B. Cooper suspect that a lot of people think very highly of, and his name is Ted B. Braden. I was just listening to his episode, Searching for D.B. Cooper, D.B. Cooper Found, Paratrooper of Fortune, D.B. Cooper 50th Anniversary. I thought it was one that um, he had uploaded previously, and it was like a re-upload, but I was listening to it, and I didn't um, recognize it, so I think um, yeah, I think it's one that um, I had not previously heard, but he has just uploaded Searching for D.B. Cooper Part 2, talking about uh, the Vietnam years, and um, I mean, a lot of people think that um, Drew's suspect is very credible. However, in that episode that I was just um, referencing, he goes through a lot of the famous D.B. Cooper suspects and tries to point out the plot holes in other people's story, and I'm not gonna lie, when you just laid out the facts about this one guy named Kenny Christensen, it sounds like the guy is a really credible suspect until you hear Drew's um, counter-arguments, or his rebuttal, or his refutations, or he's explaining why each suspect is not D.B. Cooper. But if you would truly like to know what happened in the D.B. Cooper case, I recommend you go over to Disney Plus and watch the show Loki. They provide one of the most convincing D.B. Cooper theories that I have ever seen. Sarcasm. Okay, and on to the next uh, order here. But one more time, that is Drew Beeson's series on uh, D.B. Cooper, Ted B. Braden, and he has a book out called Paratrooper of Fortune. So, um, I would like to go to some of the questions that you guys have been sending in about the Zodiac Killer as well as all other subjects. And the first one comes to us from Planet X Filmworks who says, Donna Lass is the one I know least about. Did you skip Gaviota because you covered it previously? And you heard um, at the beginning that I listed my uh, choices um, or possible choices for you guys. Um, Sherry Jo Bates, the murder of Ray Davis, the Swindle murders, and Donna Lass. And why did I skip Gaviota? Yes, I've done one big expose on the Gaviota shooting, the Domingo Edwards murders, and that's available here on YouTube under that title, just that, the Domingo Edwards murders. But um, I, because I have done something about that in the past, like exploring it a little bit, I wanted to look at some of these other cases that are unconfirmed Zodiac incidents. And the answer isn't only to learn. Is this um, a Zodiac crime or not? Was the Zodiac killer responsible for this person's murder or disappearance or not? Instead, I wanted to um, do it in somewhat of a humanizing way. Look at who this person was, share as much as we can about their life, and make the person, whether it's Sherry Jo Bates or the Swindles or Ray Davis or Donna Lass, make them the center point of it all and not the Zodiac killer. I've also mentioned the Domingo Edwards murders a lot in several AMAs recently. I mean, I have episodes on Sherry Jo Bates, but they haven't uh, come out as recently as that one on the Domingo Edwards murders, so I guess, um, I guess I haven't talked about her in a while. And I did a couple episodes on her closer to the anniversary of her death, which was on October 30th, and um, her body was found on October 31st, Halloween morning. We have a question that has come in, or sorry, this is just a comment, rather, by Blitzberg on the episode The Execution of Lamericus Davidson. This is talking about the Knoxville Nightmare, the murders of Chan and Christian and Christopher Newsom, and he said, Death should have been on prime time. Death to all of them. All five of them got off easy. Now, with the murders of Chan and Christian and Christopher Newsom, the ringleader in that case was named Lamericus Davidson. He was also known as Slim. That was his nickname. And he was sentenced to death, but his cohorts, his accomplices, the other active participants in the murder did not receive a death sentence. And when Lamericus Davidson was sentenced to death, there was an uproar in the courthouse and the courtroom. People were cheering, and a lot of people really wanted all of the other participants to receive the death penalty. However, 
that happens all the time in the world of true crime. The leader, the ringleader of a crime spree gets a harsher sentence, and I think that that is just a bitter reality. I get a lot of hate mail because of that episode, The Execution of Lamericus Davidson, and it's because of a very small detail that I misstated. The body of Christopher Newsom was uh, placed onto train tracks after his murder, and I said that he had been thrown in front of a train, and um, those aren't the same thing. And even like, I think it's been over a year now, but when I was recording that episode, I was like, wait a second, did I say something too far? Like, you know, adding in too much um, things or just, did I get that right? I think I was saying that, I was thinking that as I was recording the episode. But yes, um, Christopher uh, Newsom was not thrown in front of a train. He was thrown on two train tracks. At least once a week, somebody writes in to tell me that I got that wrong and that, well, I have a, another episode that was done on the Knoxville Nightmare that was really trying to go through the news coverage of the Knoxville News Sentinel. And um, they have hours and hours of material on the murders of Channing Christian and Christopher Newsom because it was a very heinous crime. They, the victims were raped, tortured, and one was thrown onto train tracks, and the body of Shannon Christian was placed into a trash bag and carried out, thrown out like the garbage, and a lot of people were just absolutely infuriated by the major participants in this, especially by the ringleader, Lamericus Davidson. But um, thank you for the comment all the same, Blitzberg. Okay, I would like to go to the next question, which was sent in to the email. Anybody can write the show at blackboxonlineradio at AOL.com. And this comes to us from Gregory, who says, Hey, Ned, was wondering if you'd consider doing anything on your show with relation to the paranormal, specifically UFO phenomenon. As you know, a month ago, there was a greatly anticipated report released by the Pentagon detailing its findings, or lack thereof, investigating over 100 incidents. And um, I'll jump ahead here one more time because he says, if you want to look into one, I recommend this one, the Gulf Breeze UFO Incident. And uh, Gregory has sent me a documentary here that I can watch. I will definitely do this, watch and respond in a future discussion. As far as the paranormal goes, um, I have talked about that a little bit on this channel. Last October, I did a series of... Um, paranormal haunting episodes, and back in 2018, for that deep dive podcast segment that I mentioned, it was called Occult Mondays, and I was just doing that, like, looking at things that could be paranormal, it could be either occult-related, or dealing with the occult, and one of them was called 333, The Time of Paranormal Activity, which is the exploring this idea that there's this belief that at the time, 3 o'clock in the morning and 33 minutes after the hour, 3.33 is the peak time of paranormal activity because that's when the evil spirits are mocking the Holy Trinity. It's about eight minutes long, but that was one of my favorite episodes that I have ever recorded for BBO War, and I believe it's on the, um, I believe it's on a playlist here on this channel called the Secret Gray Box Recordings, and yes, it's really in the pure podcast format, just a gray box on the screen, but there are many of those here. And with regard to UFOs, I've talked about Travis Walton, the uh, Snowflake Arizona experience, or I should just say the Walton experience from Snowflake Arizona. Travis Walton's uh, case is one of the more widely known ones because he was actually missing for an accurate time frame. I also have an episode on Riley Martin talking a lot about um, his experiences with the alien Oquan Tan Gen Wan, also known as Tan. The Coming of Tan is the, the book that was written by Riley Martin. I'd, um, I mentioned Riley in a very general UFO episode that I did in 2020, but then I wanted to expand on that because I'm um, just sharing the things that I had seen from Riley Martin in the media. And um, if you do listen back to that episode, it is also a response to a therapy session that Sirius Satellite Radio asked Riley Martin to do, and I was responding to a lot of the comments that his uh, therapist for the day had made about him. And it's um, 
it, it's some controver controversial stuff because the therapist is almost trying to say things like it's all in your head. Like, I mean, like you weren't abducted by aliens, you don't communicate with them. But I'm sure that the thing that has been recommended here, talking about these um, Pentagon inquiries, is not going to be something like, well, it's not because your parents didn't love you or something like that. Um, I mean, no, I mean, that's definitely like some thought-provoking stuff to watch if you do go back and watch some of the things like Riley Martin's therapy session and maybe it's more thought-provoking for the audience. The people in the comment section on YouTube were not having it, though. They just didn't want to listen to anything that skeptical guy had to say. But um, I'm going to look into this one. However, I think it was Steve who recommended one to me. It was the David Ferber UFO incident. And I think that's also referred to something as, like, the pill capsule UFO. And that one is challenging. This guy went on Joe Rogan, and he shared... um his observations, and the problem with that one is I can't simply provide a skeptical response. I was like, looking into it, there's just no alternative explanation that I can think of. And it doesn't mean purely that everything um, that the guy's saying is absolutely correct, or it doesn't mean that it has to be a flying saucer. It just means, like, I can't explain it. And that was mentioned in the um, AMA where I did the legal ecstasy called Katie. And there's something like that in the title, AMA, Katie, and the um, UFO incident. But um, thank you guys for the comments all the same. And one more time, the Gulf Breeze UFO incident. Please look out for a future episode on that here on the channel. Okay, moving on to the next question and comment here. We have one about the Zodiac Killer and the first confirmed Zodiac Killer victims, David Faraday and Betty Lou Jensen. Now, this one is from Irish Brummy Zero One. David Faraday's mother worked at Travis Air Force Base. Probably just a coincidence, but I thought I would mention it. I mean, that might be a coincidence, but this was on the episode Zodiac Gareth Penn Times 17 Book Discussion Part 2, and I have a six part series on Gareth Penn's book Times 17. All right, why is this important? Because in that book, Time 17, Gareth Penn is talking about how if you put an angle of 57.29 degrees on top of Mount Diablo, one arm of the angle, the radian, goes to Mount... To, to, yeah, it goes to Mount Diablo. No, it goes to um, Blue Rock Springs, and the other arm goes to Presidio Heights, where Paul Stein was murdered on October 11th. In the center of the radian is uh, Lake Berryessa, the third Zodiac incident site, and then Lake Berryessa is equidistant to Mount Diablo, as is Travis Air Force Base. And if you also read the writings of Robert Graysmith, he talked a lot about Travis Air Force Base. He thought that that's how the Zodiac obtained wing walker boots that were found at Lake Berryessa, pointing out that Arthur Lee Allen had a definitive connection there, even working at Travis Air Force Base for a time being. So, um, David Faraday's mother has a connection there. Is that uh, someone who is, is that, is that someone trying to send a sign to David Faraday's mother about why he was murdered? Maybe the victims actually were pre-chosen. I think that um, it's always good to look into uh, these things, and I, um, I do uh, appreciate the comment all the same, because as somebody once put in the comment section, you never truly know until you investigate, right? The next Zodiac Killer question and comment comes to us from Susan Snyder, who says, Totally unrelated, but I wonder, not that long ago, criminals were sent to the gallows. Perhaps a loved one of the Zodiac Killer suffered such a fate? Question mark. Um, it might be, and it might be that um, the costume that was seen at Lake Berryessa by Brian Hartle and Cecilia Shepard, the one that has the black hood with the clip-on sunglasses, that is the only time that the Zodiac Killer committed a crime wearing the Zodiac symbol, nonetheless, to the best of our knowledge, was um, representing an executioner's hood. That could be the big thing. This is mostly attributed to the Zodiac Killer's later references to the Mikado, which features a Lord High Executioner. However, Susan Snyder almost is saying that, could it be a double meaning, and let's not kid ourselves, people were hanged or executed much har more harshly in the years prior to 1969. Even one Zodiac Killer suspect, Frank Dryman Valentine, was sentenced to hang twice, and the lawyers got involved, and 
he ended up getting life in prison, and he did 13 years on a life sentence, I believe. It's just around that because he was sentenced for the 1951 murder of Clarence Pellet up in Montana, and he was sent to Deer Lodge Prison. Frank Dryman Valentine is quite an odd Zodiac Killer suspect because he's sent to Deer Lodge Prison. He's granted parole in January of 1969 after the Lake Herman Road murders. So anybody who thinks that Frank Dryman Valentine was the Zodiac Killer, well, he Lake Herman Road would have had to have been... Um, a hoax or not genuine Zodiac activity. That would be another case of the Zodiac killer taking credit for um, a crime that he didn't commit. And then he goes on to commit Blue Rock Springs, Lake Berryessa, and the Paul Stein murder. So um, I think that is, uh, that's also something that to ponder. But as of now, I have to say that Lake Herman Road is genuine Zodiac activity. I've looked at the possibility in the past. I've talked very clearly about it. When somebody asked this question during an AMA once, I said the Lake Herman Road murders are fascinating because there's such a high chance that it was not the Zodiac killer, that it was a drug-related or gang-related crime. Or, I mean, as um, Irish Bromey just pointed out, maybe this um, maybe was someone from Travis Air Force Base who had... A problem with David Faraday's mother? I mean, granted, that's just speculation, but there are all these things about, was it, was there a different perpetrator at Lake Herman Road compared to the crimes that took place in the summer of 1969? And it is important to remember that the Zodiac Killer did not send in any letters immediately after Lake Herman Road. If this is all meant to be some giant criminal masterpiece that is loaded with mathematical signatures and Lake Herman Road is genuine Zodiac activity, it is difficult to explain that seven-month gap from Lake Herman Road to Blue Rock Springs, and then the letters come out in the summer of 1969. What a lot of people do is they try to connect this to... Um, to a homicidal maniac who has been operating since 1962 or 63, maybe even 1966, and you have some person who's just committing lots of murders, and for some reason, they decided to start mailing in letters in 69 because they're, they believe that their suspect was murdering people since Ray Davis in 62, and maybe all the way up to Donna Lass and beyond, maybe the Sacramento freeway murders of 1986. So that's their explanation for it. Well, this guy already is a homicidal maniac, and the litters had their own uh, special meaning. But I, I do not accept any of the unconfirmed crimes. Lake Herman Road is confirmed now until I see some convincing proof otherwise. Oh, I do have to have to say one thing here. Walter has written in saying, Hey, Ned, I just saw on YouTube that someone in J.C. Brings family just wrote a book. It was his nephew, supposedly a tell-all, maybe of interest to you. Oh, I would love to read that, actually. J.C. Sebring, one of the victims in the Tate LaBianca murders, not Zodiac Killer, of course. This is um, Charles Manson. But um, thank you for recommending that. I love to just learn more about this. I try to watch every documentary that I can on Charles Manson, and I'm still working on that uh, project, as I like to call it, listening to the backlog of the Tate LaBianca radio program. And I believe that there is also going to be a book that is coming out soon from the co-host of that, Tana Laufenberg. Now, they say this on the show, they always say it in a joking way, that she was the last person to interview Charles Manson before he passed away. So um, I definitely would uh, like to hear what, um, what she says in her book, no matter what. So, I was just looking for the comment, and I found it here. Um, this is a Zodiac Killer one again. And it's from Justice, and Justice um, proposed a very interesting theory about the Zodiac case that involves a partnership. Justice writes, What I meant to say is, the killer would have committed murders before Blue Rock Springs, such as Ray Davis in 1962, Domingo Edwards in 63, the Swindles in 64, maybe Molina Rodriguez in 67, David Faraday and Betty Lou Jensen in 68, and then recruited the letter writer, shortly before the murder of Darlene Farron, which would explain why the letters didn't start until then. And there are two letters, there are two comments, excuse me, that are here on this. And the first one is from Planet X Filmworks, who says, letters were sent during the Sherry Joe Bates uh, crimes, though, which was in 66. 
And then Justice responded by saying, I don't think Sherry Jo Bates was killed by the Zodiac. There is the potential that the letter writer also sent those letters before he connected with the other killer. Ella, and this is, there's, there are two things here. Firstly, Justice, very insightful statement. Some people believe that the letters that came after Sherry Jo Bates' murder in October of 66 were written by someone who was connected to the Zodiac Killer mystery, but not the real killer. That was a theory that people were talking about a lot in 2020. I haven't really heard anyone talk about it too recently until I read this comment by Justice. Because she's an unconfirmed Zodiac victim, I don't believe any of the unconfirmed crimes are genuine Zodiac activity. I'm waiting for the proof, and I'm challenging all of them. And that includes the 1966 murder of Sherry Jo Bates. But, um... The theory that justice is exploring involves two people. You have a killer and a different letter writer, but it's like what we were just saying before, a minute ago. There is this homicidal individual who is committing murders. There is a serial killer who was on the loose, terrorizing Northern and Southern California, starting in Southern California, actually. We're going to go back to the early 1960s, whether it's... um. Domingo Edwards or the Swindle murders in San Diego, and then moving northward. But all of these crimes are taking place in California. And then the killer just partners with a letter writer during the summer of 1969, and the letters just go on and on and on. The final confirmed Zodiac incident is on October 11th of 1969. Then you have letters in November, the mailing of the 340 cipher, all kinds of stuff in December of 1969, particularly the Melvin Belli letter. And then this gets into what the Zodiac's going to do in the 70s about mailing in more ciphers, the Halloween card, which could be the most valuable piece of info. Um, I don't know if it's uh, fair to say that um, it gives away the killer's identity, but for a while I thought the Halloween card that the Zodiac mailed on October 27th of 1970 was the biggest tease, or it's like, it's the biggest gamble. It's actually putting out the clues to that person's identity. And the Zodiac continues to write definitely until 1974 with the Exorcist letter. In the past, I thought the Exorcist letter, which um, is the one that says, I saw and think that the Exorcist was the best satirical comedy, and um, he plunged into the suicide's grave, tit willow, tit willow, tit willow, I'm skipping a few lines, but... Um, it's that one. P.S. If I don't see this note in the paper, I'll do something nasty, which you know I'm capable of. That one doesn't really give a lot about his identity. And there's some good explanations that have been provided in Mike Morford's theory involving his suspect, McDuff, that the guy was doing it before he got married in 74. And I mean, I think that that is there's something. That's the biggest thing that stands out in Morford's theory about McDuff to me. I still don't think McDuff was the Zodiac, but um, I would accept DNA evidence. But also, uh, Kevin Robert Brooks had possibly solved the clues on the Exorcist letter, saying that there's something nasty, which you know I'm capable of, and that is just to kill. But that would mean that the letter writer is continuing onward well after he's parted ways with the Zodiac killer, and that the Zodiac is actually just someone who's behind these letters. And that really is quite similar to the host theory, which that guy Thomas Henry Horan, whom I introduced at the beginning, is a believer in, that one person was writing letters taking credit for murders that he didn't commit. But after November 9th of 1969, someone else is writing the letters in the hoax theory. And um, there are so many layers to that, and you can hear all about that in my episode, Zodiac Killer Hoax Theory Open Discussion, or the book discussion on the myth of the Zodiac Killer. A lot of things about the hoax theory on this channel. Well, I just wanted to touch base with you guys and um, share some of these things that are going to be out in the world of true crime. I would just say that the last episode, uh, or sorry, the last thing that I want to share with you is an episode on the Lord and Arts channel. I used to be an absolute um, diehard listener to the Lord and Arts channel, which is hosted by John Lorden, and he has a producer who works with him on his Monday show, 
called Case Cracked, and the, the episode is called Case Cracked, The Pet Man. I would just leave you with that one because, I mean, there is an enormous story in that one. That was a very good episode. And no, it's not Zodiac, Manson, or Son of Sam related. It is a murder story that took place in the United Kingdom. And it's possible that they even used the DNA from a dog to catch a killer. And one more time, The Pet Man, Case Cracked, it is available on the Lord and Arts channel. And uh, John Lord's producer for that one is named Christy Arnhart. And she is um, now a co-host of Case Cracked, but she does a lot of the writing for that Monday show on the Lord and Arts channel, Case Cracked. Okay, so one more time, you can download the show at Launchpad1, formerly known as Launchpad DM. You can write me at blackboxonlineradio at AOL.com. Feel free to visit the Teespring page, and I will see you on Instagram for the bonus podcast. Until next time.